Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the Lead X Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. What are four mental skills crucial to learning things fast? Hello everyone, Kevin Cruz here. And in just a minute, we're going to talk about how to get good at things fast so you can stay ready for the future. But first, don't forget to visit leadx.org, where you'll find hundreds of articles from the best leadership and career experts out there. And sign up for our quick read newsletter, which is packed with actionable tips you can try out right away. Visit leadx.org. Our guest today is the founding partner of Proteus, a coaching, consulting, and training firm that focuses on leader readiness. She has advised executives and companies like NBC Universal, Tory Burch, GE, Madison Square Garden, Hulu, and Viacom. She's one of the most popular leadership contributors on Forbes.com. She's the author of several best selling leadership books, and her newest is Be Bad First Get Good at Things Fast to Stay Ready for the Future. Our guest, is Erica Anderson. Erica, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for making the time. And we're going to talk about Be Bad First in just a second. But I always like to ask our guests to share a time when they failed, maybe early in your career, because I want to know what you learned from it so we can all learn the same lesson. I love this question. So I failed multiple times throughout my career. And I noticed in retrospect, and even at the time, I realized that most of my early failures were failures of context. And what I mean by that is, I'll give you one example. So early on, this was in my late 20s, I think, I was tasked with creating a proposal for a client. And I knew what I was trying to say. I said it very simply, very clearly, a couple pages, boom, I was thrilled it was so simple. And my manager, a guy named Prentice Uchida, who was one of my two good managers I ever had, he very kindly carried it back into my office, set it on my desk and said, this is not enough. Mm. And I thought he was just trying to get me to pat it kind of. And I right. said, oh, OK, you know, Prentice, I can do more. He goes, no, no, you know what you're saying and why it's important. They will not know what you're saying or why it's important. And it was such an epiphany for me. I just felt like, oh, right. I was doing this entirely from my point of view. Yeah. No sense of how they would need to be brought into it, how I was going to have to make the case. I was just like, boom, go right to the end. We're done. Check. And it was just incredible. And I've seen how most of my mistakes that I've made and most of the things that I've done that haven't worked have been in that frame. Some people do that too much. They do too much contextualization. Mm -hmm. Mine has always been not enough. So, And I feel like that lesson has been, served me in good stead now for 40 years, and I feel like I need to keep getting better and better at it all the time. Wow, that's great. And it shows a dedication to your craft as, a, as, as an author and writer, among, among other things, because that context or knowing how much to provide and how much to you know, not pad is, is really a key. Yes, and also really knowing what the other person knows. Like the, the, another early failure I had, which is kind of related, is my – this was right after I started Proteus, so this is almost 30 years ago. My initial business partner, a wonderful guy named Marty Seldman, we were doing um, a program for some senior people at actually at KFC. And I thought it was going well and everything was good and it was going okay. But then <laughs> Marty pulled me aside at a break and he said – this great thing, which has been like a bumper sticker in my mind for the last 25 years. He said, Erica, you know what? I've found that people believe what they say more than they believe what you say, even if it's the same thing. <laughs> and I realized that I was just giving them everything I knew. And what I, what I learned from Marty is just show them where to look. Don't tell them what to see. Mm. And I feel like that's been so incredibly helpful to me as a coach, as a colleague, as a manager. Just you don't have to tell everybody everything. Just kind of turn their eyes in a certain direction and see what they see over there. You know, love that. That's great. So, Erica, your new book is Be Bad First, Get Good at Things Fast to Stay Ready for the Future. I mean, let's start at the beginning. Why is it so important for us now to get good at things fast? So I spend, as you know, having read the book, a couple of chapters talking about that. Right. And, and the, the main thing is that everything is moving so much more quickly. And I don't, I don't even, this is something I don't think I do have to make much of a case for, although it was fun to make the case in the book, that one of the things I used in the book is 
Buckminster Fuller wrote a book about 35 years ago called The Critical Path about how fast knowledge is doubling. And um, he predicted that by now, human knowledge would be doubling at the rate of once a year. Mm. And people who have followed up on his work say, yes, that's about right. So a hundred years ago, knowledge was doubling once every hundred years. So what that means is that for our grandparents and great grandparents, you know, you, you get a job and then you pretty much do that job until you retire or die. And it's pretty much the same job. And now there's a study that was done recently with millennials where they, they found out that most millennials think that the job they have now will not exist by the time they're ready to retire, if they ever retire. Right. And I think we all, we all know that. Like I, I, you know, last summer I was doing a big speaking engagement and there were about a thousand people. And I said, okay, raise your hand if your job has not changed in the last year. Hmm. One, one or two people raised their hands, you know? So I've come to believe, and this is why I wrote this book, that the capability of learning new things, acquiring new skills and new understanding quickly and continuously is the key skill for everybody right now. Yeah. And Eric, I am such a believer in what you just said. And I think this message is so important. I mean, people probably think like I'm, <laughs> I'm on the prepper end of the scale because like, I, I think the robots are coming, <laughs> you know, I mean, w whether it, it used to be that, oh, you know, you were a blue collar worker, you assembled cars and now the robots are building the cars. Yes. But I also think, you know, you're a physician, you're an accountant, uh, you know, there's these white collar knowledge workers where, look, you know, artificial intelligence is advancing so fast that these AI computer robots can look at an x-ray or, or whatever better than, or, you know, read a CAT scan and stuff better than humans. And I think things are changing so quickly. I mean, it's actually what this whole show is about is this lead X show is not for everybody. It's for people who say, I need to be always getting better. I need to be always yes. learning. How do I do that quickly? That's why the show is generally short. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a nut about this and I, I think it's a great message. And so you have sort of a, a framework. You say there are four skills of mastery that, that we need in order to, to learn fast. So what are they? Yes. And so I came upon these over the course of, you know, 30 years of doing this kind of work, the same kind, you know, you and I do the same kind of work, helping people become their best selves and learn new things. And so I noticed that people who were good at getting good, people who were good at learning new things and not sort of resting on their laurels, they had four mental skills that we came to think of and call a new. So that stands for aspiration, neutral self-awareness, endless curiosity, and willingness to be bad first. Hmm. So just to give the kind of you want me to give the kind of yeah, digest for you? Yeah. Okay. So aspiration means wanting. So what we found is that people who were especially good learners knew that they could raise their level of aspiration. People who aren't very good at learning, they figure, well, I don't want to learn it. I'm not going to learn it. It's boring. Next, you know, people, <laughs> people who are good learners say, well, I may not want to learn it now, but I need to. So how do I raise my level of aspiration? They know that unless they want to, they're not going to. And what we found was that good learners do that by thinking about the personal benefits, the benefits that will accrue to them personally mm. by learning a new thing. Because that's how we all want, when we want to do something, it's because we see how it will benefit us. So you can look to those things. You can look for those things. And once you get clear about how it's going to benefit you, you can feel your aspirations starting to rise. If we have time later, I'll give some yeah. funny examples about that. So then neutral self-awareness is just exactly what it sounds like. People who are good learners know where they're starting from. And my favorite example to give of the opposite of this is the, you know, when I always used to watch American Idol and there were always people on there who literally could not sing. Right, right. <laughs> and you think to yourself, what, how... <laughs> What on earth <laughs> made you think? And you and you realize that they're just not neutrally self-aware. They probably have one person in their life, their mom or their boyfriend or whatever, who tells them they can sing. And then all of the other inputs they're getting, they just completely ignore. And so people who are good at learning, they're willing to get clear about where they're starting from. Because it's only when you're accurate about where you're starting from that you know what you're going to need to progress. So we talk in the book about how can you get accurate in your self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing, endless curiosity, is 
I love this one because it's inborn. If if you've ever been around little kids, your own or anyone else's, they are relentlessly curious. And in fact, in the course of doing research for the book, what I found is that a lot of brain scientists think of curiosity as a drive in hmm. babies and small children, the same way hunger and thirst are drives, wow. that it's a survival mechanism. And they define, as we define curiosity, as the drive to know and understand. And so kids have that. If you've seen a little kid do something 20 times and ask a million questions, they have this relentless urge to understand and to master. And what happens is we get kind of socialized out of that as we get older. You know, I always say the difference between a four-year-old and a 14-year-old is the four-year-old will say, ooh, ooh, explain that to me. Why does that happen? And a 14-year-old says, oh, no. I know more about that than you do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm probably smarter than you are too. And then it gets worse as we get to be grown ups. None of us want to be the person in the meeting that goes, Oh, wait, I don't understand that. Can you explain it to me? Right. So the what we talk about in the book is how do you re engage that childhood curiosity? Because obviously if you look at kids, it's such jet fuel for learning. If you can really reown, re engage your childhood curiosity, everything goes so much more quickly when you're trying to learn something new. And let me interrupt before you move on to the fourth one, Eric, because, you know, what's interesting, um, I've been having a lot of conversations recently, you know, with others sort of in our field who are talking about the importance of like psychological safety at work or, you know, workplace culture where it's okay to make mistakes, ask questions. And wow, I mean, this just shows like if you want to stay relevant, if you want to be learning quickly, you had better be working in an organization that says, hey, endless curiosity is okay. And yes. instead of one of those organizations is like, geez, can you believe that dumb question Kevin just asked? Like, he ain't up for promotion anymore. And so that's really important that you're, you know, in an environment that can, like, once you figure this out, your environment has to support it as well. Absolutely critical. That's a great insight. And in fact, the last interview I was doing about the book, somebody said, well, how do you create that kind of environment? And I said, you as a leader have to model it. Mm. And it's actually pretty straightforward. And I've seen this so many times. If if a group has a leader that, who is willing to, in a meeting, go, oh, wait, I don't, can you explain? Explain that again or use different words. I'm not sure I understand that. Or can you tell me much more about that? I, I really haven't had much experience. It's so liberating because then everybody in the room gradually becomes willing to ask those kinds of questions and to have that kind of free form what's going on around here learning environment. But if the leader doesn't model it, it just won't happen because then what's being demonstrated to people is it's not safe to do that. Right. And then I interrupted you. There is a fourth <laughs> yes. And the fourth one is the big kahuna. It's the one that is most difficult for most people, willingness to be bad first. And the problem is that we love being good at things, but we don't as much like the process of getting good at things, especially if we have to do it in public, which we mm. have to do at work. And by the time most of us get to be you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, we like to think of ourselves as experts. And so to go back to being a novice, and it's not really about failure so much. It's about noviceness. It's about being in that situation where you're kind of clumsy and you're slow and you have to ask dumb questions and you have to do things over and over again and you're not satisfied with the outcome. That state of being a novice is very uncomfortable for us. So what, what I talk about in the book is the mindset, because mindset is key, the mindset that you need to get into in order to be able to be comfortable in that uncomfortable state of being a novice which allows you to move through it much more quickly. Makes sense. And I want to hit that acronym again for the listeners, you know, a new aspiration, neutral self-awareness, endless curiosity, and willing to be bad first. So wh where do people get stuck as they're trying to develop their a new skills, this mastery of these mental skills? I love that question there. And there are two kind of different answers. The first answer is that different people have different rough spots, mm. like if I was going to use myself, that I'm willingness to be bad first is my hardest. I am both impatient and hate being bad at stuff. So I've really had to work on that over the years. Whereas for my husband, he's remarkably good at that and is a great model for me. He's like, yep, I suck at this. Let me try. You know? <laughs> and his hard thing is aspiration. It's hard for him to recognize that he can want to do something that he doesn't now want to do. He really has to work on that. So I think that's kind of like a fingerprint, you know, right. different. And some people are, it's hard for them to be curious. Some people, it's hard to be self-aware. But the second, 
second answer is that for most people, the main difficulty is the skill that underlies all of these, and especially the last three, the NEW, is being able to manage your own self-talk. Because all of these are mental skills. They, they live, you know, in the privacy of your own brain. Mm-hmm. And how we talk to ourselves about ourselves is at the root of being able to be neutrally self-aware and curious and willing to be bad. Well, wow. and I mean, that's a whole nother show, right? Because that gets to yeah. mindfulness and even being aware of the chatter that's going on yes. in our mind and to realize that we are not that self-talk and that we have some control over it, right? Precisely. And a lot more. And what I just, if, if somebody reads the book, they will see I, this is really a theme throughout that not only can we become aware of it, we can revise it and have that really change the way we feel and the way we behave, that we have far more control over that interior monologue than we think we do. And that is a powerful tool to have. Most people, a lot of people don't even know that they talk to themselves. Right. And people, those of us who do know that we talk to ourselves, we don't often feel like we have control over it. It's sort of like subliminal advertising, you know, because it's going on inside your head, kind of under your conscious awareness. It sort of runs your life and you're not aware of it. But man, if you can start to manage that, it's such a powerful tool. And, you know, people think I, um, (laughs) maybe I do hype things, but I I try to offer stuff that is literally life-changing. And Erica, what you just described can literally be life-changing. It can literally be life-changing. Yes. Yeah. It, it's like, yeah, there is that talk going on and you you can control it and change it to some degree. And someone was telling me recently, I thought it was kind of interesting. And he said, you know, it's never the first thought that gets you in trouble. It's the thought about that thought. <laughs> it's the second and the oh, third. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so you need to sort of just... Um, he was describing it to me as sort of, it's almost like watching, you know, the, the leaf or the stick in the river flow by. It's like, oh, I just had that jealous thought, or I just had that limiting self-belief, but wasn't that interesting? And then you don't dive onto it or hold onto it and make it, you know, more powerful than it is. So I'll give you a be bad first example that I think really, I agree with everything you're saying. I think where people don't make it as useful as they can is they stop at just mindfulness, just Mm. awareness. You can actually revise it. So for instance, most of the time when people are in that novice state, especially if they're having to do it in public at work, you know, they're learning a new thing and the kind of talk that goes in your head, the monologue that's running in your head is, oh my God, I'm terrible at this. I'm going to look so bad. People are going to think I'm an idiot. Oh, I, this will just ruin my reputation. I won't have any credibility. It's like a static, right? Mm. It's just like a hundred thoughts in your head. And it fills up your mind so much that you actually don't have any bandwidth to take in new stuff. So what we encourage is to literally change your self-talk. So you hear all that going on in your head. And instead, it turns out that the ideal self-talk for being bad is to think to yourself two things, two kind of balancing things. One is, I am going to be bad at this for a while. (laughs) Seriously, I've never done it before. How could I possibly be good? It would be unrealistic for me to expect myself to be good. So I'm going to be bad at this for a while. And I bet I can get good at it. I've gotten good at a lot of things. And those two, they're both true. They're both accurate. And when, if you can really just think those, you know, you start thinking, I'm terrible. I'm an idiot. Everybody's going to, you go, do, do, do. Wait a minute. I'm going to be bad at this for a little while. And I know I can get good. It's almost magical. It's like the noise in your head starts to calm down. You start to actually be able to see the situation around you and you can start to learn. And I've done this myself a lot. So I'm not just making this up. And one example, if we have a little time, could I? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So one example that happened to me recently that was so profound. I always try and eat my own, you know, caviar. So (laughs) uh, last year, I realized one learning challenge I could take on is to really become fluent in Spanish. Wow. Because I took Spanish in high school and I kind of knew it a little bit, you know, whatever you learn in high school. And I said, you know what, this is something I can do. So I'm going to do it. And so one of the things I decided to do was we have a consultant, Vanessa, who speaks four languages fluently. I'm so jealous, <laughs> one of which is Spanish. And so at the beginning of last year, I said, OK, Vanessa, let's have a couple of times a month. Let's have a conversation by phone. She's in D.C. in Spanish. And she was new to us. So we figured it would be a way for her to learn more about produce and be a way for me to practice speaking business Spanish. Right. 
So before the first call, and she said, great, fine. Before the first call, I was so anxious and so nervous. And, oh, I'm going to sound like such an idiot. And I'm, there's all these words I'm not going to know, you know, just right. in my head, all this noise. And I said to myself, I'm going to be bad at this to start with. I haven't really practiced Spanish for, you know, 40 years. And I'm not going to be good at this. And I bet I can get good. I'm kind of relentless. And I love language. And, you know, ultimately, I'll get good. It was such a relief. It just kind of that all kind of like, whoa, noise started to go down in my head. And that first conversation, even though it was hard and a little embarrassing, it was about one tenth as difficult as it would have been otherwise. I just kept coming back to that self-talk in my head as the like, oh, you're an idiot. You know, that would come up and I go, no, no, it's okay. I'm going to be bad at this for a little while. I'm going to get good at it. And by the end of that half hour conversation, I was improving. I could feel myself improving. And now I'm not entirely fluent, but a year plus later, you know, I could probably be doing this interview in Spanish. Wow, that is amazing. And I'm glad you clarified some of the, you know, specifically how to change the the self-talk because it's different. The way you describe it, it's different than like affirmations. And exactly. You're not saying... I am fluent in Spanish. Yeah, I am no. a millionaire because I, I don't I don't know what the science is behind that stuff or not. But I have a feeling like my subconscious knows I'm not fluent in Spanish. That's I am not, exactly right? right. That let me ding 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 yeah. because that's whenever we talk about managing your self talk, people say, "Oh, is it that you know stupid <laughs> smiley affirmation thing?" I'm like, no, because your subconscious mind is smart and will reject that as BS. You need to change your self talk in a way that is acceptable to you. So this, I'm, ba- I'm going to be bad at this for a little while, and I bet I can get good at it. That's, that's accurate. That's true. And your mind goes, yep, that seems right. Okay, I can accept that. <laughs> and Eric, I'm literally you're talking about life change. Like, this is, this is going to sound corny, but I'm actually going to go teach this to my teenagers because I'm remembering, uh, this is obviously a lot of years ago, but like, I was a pretty good student in most subjects, but like, there was something about like calculus that was just awful. Yes. And when I think back to that, I can feel like the physiology of my body changing. I'm starting to get yes. hot and like rushed feeling and everything. And, and I can remember, I can so easily go back and it's because all of that noise it was like I stink at this I will never get it this is so hard I'm gonna fail I hope I don't fail like it was all that and I had no idea no tools no alternatives no alternatives and I'm thinking of my own kids who again they're good kids who often will struggle in a certain subject or a big test or whatever and to let them know that they can change some of that self-talk and it will literally change your physiology and then make good things happen Exactly. Exactly. It changes your physiology. It changes your psychology. It's really quite amazing. And I love that you're on this. this And I love that you're sharing it with your kids. I've always tried to share the best of what I understand with my kids. And they now as grownups actually tell me they like it. <laughs> <laughs> now that they're grownups. <laughs> so Eric, um, before we wrap up, I always want our listeners, I'm saying, hey, get a little bit better every single day. And I want them to kind of immediately take action on this stuff so they can anchor it a little bit better. So give us a challenge. I mean, what what do you want us to go out and do? Exactly what we've been talking about. Mastering your self-talk is the key to learning, which is the key to success. So Mm. I would challenge every one of your listeners to at some point in the next 12 hours, just sit quietly for a minute and notice what you're saying to yourself. And if it's not helpful, if it's not supportive, if it's getting in your way, just substitute something which is true and accurate, but more supportive and see what happens. Love it. Erica, thanks for coming on the show. And what's the best way for our listeners to find out more about you and your work? Oh, many ways. So I have a blog at ericaanderson.com and you're welcome to go on my company's website, which is proteus-international.com. And as you know, I have a blog at Forbes or you can read any of my books. <laughs> All those things. <laughs> All great things. Okay, friends, you've just been mentored by leadership guru Erica Anderson. Don't forget, you can get the links that she just mentioned and the notes from this interview over at leadx.org. You can get Erica's new book and other books from amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. And listeners, if you got just one idea from this interview, and I'm jotting down value bombs like crazy myself, so go on up to iTunes and just leave a one or two sentence review. It'd mean the world to us. Until next time, remember, of course, 
Leadership is about influence, not authority. It's not about your title. We are all leaders. The question is, what kind of leader will you be today? 